Welcome back to film three in our series with Dr. Bhupesh Prusti. Here, Dr. Asad Khan and I ask about how clotting abnormalities fit in with the reactivated latent viruses theory and the various ways treatment might fit in. Hope you find it helpful. It does appear, at least anecdotally uh, and from case theories, that in the early part of long COVID, if you treat the coagulation abnormalities, then you can have a good clinical response. Doesn't seem to be the case so much further down the line. So when do you think that switch is occurring uh, or does it vary? How this process you've described interacts with coagulation? One key feature that we found is uh, called fibronectinia. And this molecule is very popular in the field of coagulation. Uh, what we found is that there are two aspects of uh, fibronectin. One is the its role in complement activation, and it prevents uh, bacterial as well as viral infections. And what we found is that both in long COVID patients and the MECFS patients, there is an increasing circulating fibronectin. This has actually correlation with the disease severity um, also. So um, what we think is that fibronectin normally is um, not the bad guy. Yeah, Fibronectin is, helps in the tissue injury, but if the fibronectin amounts go down on high on both sides, they can cause tissue injury as well as interfere in the blood coagulation process. And fibronectin, when meets fibrin, that's the bad part of the whole story. So we think that fibrin probably is playing a role together with fibronectin in the clotting process. And fibrin can be increased by herpes virus reactivation. Again, this is not my study. I get it, this information from the literature. Or in this um, SARS-CoV-2 infection context or in the post-vax context also, it is being reported that uh, fibrin can be um, increased or produced in the presence of SARS-CoV-2 infection, particularly the spike protein and things like that. Yeah. So when there is fibrin and fibrin in context comes in contact with uh, fibronectin, it starts producing abnormal um, uh, clotting um, um, beyond the regular clotting process. This is the secondary aspects of, uh, uh, of the disease. Um, the fibronectin is produced because of the inflammation. Fibronectin is a um, inflammation uh, response molecule. So whenever we have inflammation, fibronectin goes up. So fibronectin um, is increased, but we need the second component, which is fibrin. Fibrin can come from SARS-CoV-2. Fibrin literature says that herpes viruses, many herpes viruses, proteins, they also induced uh, fibrin production. Um, the same is with the vaccines or the spike proteins and things like that. So the second component, when it comes in together, they produce these clots. By, by targeting clotting, um, probably the primary cause of the disease is not um, resolved. So um, I'm not very sure in a long run, just by targeting clotting, if long COVID can be cured. Yeah, maybe I'm, again, I'm not very sure, but this is my um, tiny bit of skepticism. So yeah, just going back to what you said about the um, production of fibrin in response to viruses. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that has been um, demonstrated by um, Prof. Pretorius's work, uh, where mm -hmm. the spike protein uh, combines with the fibrin engine and you get the misfolded amyloid form of fibrin. I, I was wondering whether what might be happening in the early cases is that by treating the coagulation and by restoring the tissue perfusion and, and cellular function, you're actually able to clear the autoimmune phenomena and the cellular debris better. And I imagine that with time, that becomes less and less likely. Just a thought. The first um, couple of weeks to couple of months time is the time when we are dealing with only the primary aspects of the disease. And there is the possibility that you do not develop um, multiple different uh, secondary uh, clinical aspects. So if, if you if you say that, okay, maybe the, the clotting already starts as soon as the SARS-CoV-2 comes in and things like that. Again, the herpes virus reactivation is a very early event. So in the cell culture, we have uh, shown in the past that as soon as the cells carrying the latent viruses are, uh, herpes viruses are infected, you see the vi vi virus reactivation. And the virus reactivation has a negative effect on the SARS-CoV-2 also. So this happens very fast. So you can imagine that uh, the moment the SARS-CoV-2 infection starts, the same moment or within a couple of hours to a couple of days, the herpes virus reactivation or other vi uh, viral reactivation happening. So this is the time when you can imagine the blood clot process and things like that, if the fibronectin is high already in that time. So targeting that moment probably is much more easier than the later half when all the secondary processes started. So um, in this paper, we also saw that if we purify IgG from MECFS patients, particularly severe MECFS patients, and then we put on cells, particularly the primary endothelial cells, we see extensive mitochondrial damage, mitochondrial fragmentation. 
So autoimmunity has a role to play in uh, uh, endothelial cell dysfunction also. So that means that we have, um, the moment the secondary clinical feature starts playing role, we have more and more fibronectin, the, the mast cell activation, the platelet activation, the endothelial cell dysfunction, and all the other things starts playing a role. Yeah? For example, fibronectin can bind to TL, TLR2, TLR4 receptors, start producing um, other cytokines and things like that. So the later the situation is, the more complex is the uh, process. And there, just by targeting the clotting mechanism may not be that helpful. This is the only explanation that I can have at this moment. Yeah? I, I would agree. <laughs> What's the major research that you would like to do next? What are the big gaps and how would you like to try and fill them? So the biggest thing that we have is now we only studied the population. So we know that SARS-CoV-2 is doing this. Uh, the natural IgM is depleted and all those things. So when we, what we need to do is that we need to do a um, very precise um, animal study, for example, we take mice and uh, uh, do SARS-CoV-2 infection or herpes virus reactivation and things like that. And then so that the natural IgM is depleted and then probably uh, there is a possibility to understand the molecular mechanism of natural IgM depletion in mice because in human natural IgM study is very, very difficult. It's still a black box because um, no one really knows um, what are the um, sources of natural IgM uh, in human and where to uh, find them, what are the biology and things like what we know is from mice. So we probably go back to mice and um, can potentially find what are the, um, how the SARS-CoV-2 infection changing these uh, B1 cells biology and things like that. It's very interesting because there are very specific cells which produce natural IgM. This is the B B1, B uh, plasma cells, and they are only in primary and secondary hematopoietic organs. This is also uh, very interesting from the point of the changes in the gut microbiome also, because this natural IgM actually plays a very important role just below the gut uh, mucosal layer to prevent uh, secondary bacterial infection and things like that. So. Um, there is a gap here in understanding, and we need to go back uh, to animal models to, to study how things are going on. And maybe by doing that, we can potentially find a solution to find a treatment for the uh, loss of natural IgMs and things like that. Yeah. So what you're saying is that potentially the treatment would be replenishment of the natural IgM. This is what seems to be the clear. Yeah, so this is, for example, um, here this slide shows you the story of natural IgM. So we have three different natural IgM measured here. Um, IgM against uh, fibronectin, which is, uh, we claim that this possibly natural IgM because it's very high in the normal population. And we have IgM against phosphorylcholine and IgM against uh, malin aldehyde. Um, you see that this is a log two value. So you, you can see that um, the no long COVID group, they already have quite a strong drop in these natural IgM. In case of um, the classical natural IgM, like IgM uh, phosphorylcholine, IgM um, malindehyde, it's not statistically significant. But as you go down uh, mild long COVID and severe long COVID, you see the changes, log, fold, log two fold change is very high. So it's basically more or less depletion. Yeah? It's, it's a very strong decrease in this uh, natural IgM. So we believe that this is one key finding. And as you deplete these natural IgMs, you need to replenish them. Now we're trying to look into longer uh, uh, term patients, like up to 24 months after the first SARS-CoV-2 infection. Just to keep in mind that these patients have only one infection. Specifically, these are recruited patients who had one SARS-CoV-2 infection in the beginning, yeah, not recurrent infection. So you can see that we don't have too many patients here. We have um, three patients who belong to the no long COVID group, and uh, we have eight patients here which are officially being declared as MECFS. And you can see that the no long COVID group has more or less the same amount of uh, this IgM, what we find in the healthy control, the general population. But if you look into the um, MECFS group, uh, majority of them have a um, lower amount. And uh, in this case, one is an absolute outlier with an extremely high amount. We see 2% of patients within, uh, with this high amount also. So things are changing over a period of time. So those who recovers, they are more or less without having any clinical symptom. Those who are um, not getting back the same amount of natural IgM is belonging to the MECFS group. This doesn't mean that natural IgM is the sole cause of the disease, but this is a contributing factor. Yeah? So we think that it is very important to play around and try to bring the natural IgM back into its uh, condition. With respect to dealing with the autoimmunity, um, what about other modalities that are uh, being practiced and published, such as immune absorption, for example, uh, because it seems to me that you can 
remove uh, autoantibodies, but the, the phenomenon you're describing of the localized viral reactivation, that's still going to persist. Yes. So it's likely that uh, the disease will come back. I'm not um, a clinical expert here to comment on autoimmunity and uh, and uh, treatment, but um, scientifically, I agree with you that um, um, removal auto autoantibodies alone is not going to help here. That might be um, uh, helpful. Classically, it is being helpful for other autoimmune diseases, so might be helpful, but it needs to be supplemented with the root cause of the disease. Yeah. So if, for example, if we say that the loss of natural IgM is uh, so strong and we, um, because the natural IgM is not there and we're still continuing producing the new and more and more autoantibodies over a period of time. So we keep replenishing, the autoantibodies will keep coming. So we probably target both the aspects, removing the autoantibodies at the same time, removing the source of the cause of the autoantibodies. Yeah, this is one thing. And at the, um, it has to be also complemented with um, other aspects of immune modulation, if there is any change in the T cell, B cell biology, or if there is anything happening with the virus reactivation. So for example, use of the antivirals and um, other things. So it has to be a combination approach rather than going in one direction. That's what at least I hope, I believe. Makes sense to me. It's a really complex topic. Um, and I guess we're still in the infancy of understanding um, oh, yeah. you, the oh, yeah. whole process. It gives us hope that you're making progress in that direction. You're, you're trying to, and you're getting somewhere. So um, hopefully, hopefully in time, we'll be able to put all these subjects all together. Thanks for watching this series. It's been pretty technical, so well done for hanging in there till the end. Next up, uh, we're going to be talking to Dr. Jenna Tosto-Mancuso about autonomic conditioning. So stay tuned for that. Look after yourselves. Until next time.